out a little from the land so that he can address the multitude on the shore of the lake. And I want you to put in parentheses or keep in mind but the phrase there, put out a little from the land, because we're going to talk about that. And he sat down and taught the people from the boat. And when he had ceased speaking, he said to Simon, put out into the deep and put down your nets for a catch. Now I'm going to stop there, and I'm going to kind of read through some things that stand out to me, and then we'll continue reading. In verse 3, he says to Peter, put out a little from the land. The thing that strikes me about this passage, well, maybe I'll just go ahead and read through the whole thing. Let's just go ahead and read through the first 11 verses. And when he had ceased speaking, he said to Simon, put out into the deep and let down your nets for a catch. And Simon answered him, Master, we toiled all night and took nothing, but at your word I will let down the nets. When they had done this, they enclosed a great catch of fish. As their nets were breaking, they beckoned to their partners in the other boat to come and help them. And they came and filled both, both the boats so that they began to sink. But when Simon Peter saw it, he fell down at Jesus' knees, saying, Depart from me, for I am a simple man, O Lord. For he was astonished, and all that were with him, at the catch of fish which they had taken. And so also were James and John, the sons of Zebedee, who were partners with Simon. And Jesus said to Simon, Do not be afraid, for henceforth you will be catching men. And when they had brought their boats to land, they left everything and followed him. Now we'll go back to this passage of Scripture. They put out a little from the land, and Jesus began to speak to them. I can't help but think about the life of the church pastor gets up on Sunday morning, he speaks to the congregation, and, and many come. The boat doesn't need to be far, very far from the land. The boats can tend to be in the shallows. Indeed, the pastor can preach to people that may be content to live in the shallows. I hope that changes this morning for some of you. And he sat down and taught the people from the boat. And when he had ceased speaking, he said to Simon, put out to the deep and let down your nets. I want you to think about this. He didn't say to anybody else that was on the shore of the lake to put out, to put their to, to go out to the deep in their boat. He said to Simon, go out to the deep. This was a specific call for Simon. All the rest of the people that were content to remain on the shore in water up to their ankles or their knees were not invited into the deep places. Jesus invited Peter to go into the deep where Peter would find his life's purpose, which he thought at that moment was catching fish. There are many of us in Christianity today who are, who are completely content to remain in the shallows of faith. But God is saying to you today, by name, just as he spoke to Simon, by name that morning, or that evening, to put out to the deep. It's time for God's people to get hungry enough to set sail for the deep. To set sail for the higher purpose of God's call in Christ Jesus. Now listen to this. And Simon answered, Master, we have toiled all night and took nothing, but at your word I will let down the nets. I want to read my notes to you. When Jesus first met Peter, Peter was okay in the shallows. And so are we. We play in the shallows. We wait in the shallows. We hear Jesus' teaching in the shallows, but we don't catch fish in the shallows. We don't find the greater purpose of our lives in the shallows, and we cannot follow the Master playing in the shallows. Psalm 42 says, Deep cries unto deep, but all thy breakers and waterfalls fall over me, flow over me. 
that God's purpose for you today is to experience Him in the depths of His Holy Spirit, not in the shallows. How many people here, and I don't want you to raise your hand, but I want you to be honest with God this morning, have been living in the shallows of your Christian experience. You don't wake up in the morning with a fire burning in your belly and a, and a prayer upon your lips that sounds something like this. God, how can I live for you today? What is your purpose for me today, Lord? Who are you going to send me to to tell, to tell about the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ? Because that's the depths. Living for Christ. I want you to think about that phrase, put out to the deep. In an age when we are, uh, are, are driven by motor boats and electric motors, they task finding their way into the deep. They rode. And I want you to keep in the mind, this has been at the end of the day, in the evening after they had worked and toiled and caught nothing all day long. They were tired and frustrated and confused. There's nothing more grievous on the face of the earth than laboring intently in vain. Psalm 127 says, Unless the Lord builds a house, they that build will labor in vain. If your heart's not beating for the purpose of God, if you're not living for the call of God, if you're not striving in your marriage to build a marriage that honors God, if your business or your employment, or raising your children is not Christ-centered, then you labor in vain. Because it's only the things that are built upon the rock of Jesus Christ and that our eternal salvation and an eternal hope that we have in Him that will truly prevail in the end and bear the fruit that God has ordained. The call of Christ is specific. He said to Simon, God is saying to each of us, come. It doesn't matter what our neighbors are doing. It doesn't matter what our families are doing. What matters is will you respond to his call this morning and put out to the deep places of God's purpose by seeking intimacy in the Holy Spirit and living for the obedient call of Jesus. I want you to turn with me in your Bibles to 2 Corinthians chapter 10. This was one of the very, very first passages I learned as a Christian. I got saved in a little Baptist church that was filled with mighty men of God who mentored me as to how I was supposed to live a Christian life. Those men taught me what it was like to have a love for God in my heart that carried me through many years of wandering in the wilderness. They taught me what it meant to go door to door and spread the love of Jesus. They taught me. And I'll be honest with you, as a young man, amongst those older men, I felt very inadequate, very ill-equipped to share the gospel. But I had this yearning in my heart and this need to fulfill the call of God on my life. And I went, even in the inadequacies that I felt, I went and I listened and I obeyed God and I listened to the gospel. 2 Corinthians chapter 10, read verse 12. Not that we venture to class or compare ourselves with some of those who commend themselves, but when they measure themselves by one another and compare themselves with one another, they are without understanding. The King James says they are unwise. This call that God has on your life, it's not about you and somebody else. It's about you and Jesus Christ and what you can accomplish in Him if you'll let the Spirit of God live in you and let you be the best man, that you, best man woman, or person that you can be in Christ Jesus. It doesn't matter what your wife's doing. It doesn't matter what your husband's doing. It doesn't matter what your brothers and sisters are doing. It doesn't matter what your children are doing. It matters what you're willing to do. Amen. Man. It matters what you're willing to do 
for God in your relationship and in your pursuit of Him. And when you sit back and you don't get involved and you and you allow yourself to be hindered because of what use of the grace you see in somebody else's life, you are comparing yourselves amongst one another or amongst others. And the Bible says that we do that, we are unwise. And we are defeated before we even put our hands to the plow. Right. It's not about you. This isn't a race. It's a marathon for you to run with God to persevere and learn to endure in the call that he has for your life. Not your neighbor. <coughs> it's about you. You. Now, is it easier when we're around like-minded people? Absolutely. And that's exactly why we're, we go to church, because we want to be around like-minded people. We want to be around people that want what we want, not want to run the race for Jesus. Amen? Amen. And I know that's why you come to this church, because you want that too. Let's, let's go to John chapter 21. I kind of am deviating from the, uh, the text this morning with these couple of passages, but I feel like it's important that we hear the message of Christ to us. Now, mind you, this call that God is talking about is about Peter. And Peter, I love Peter because Peter is, he's, he's compulsive and, and he's unhindered and he's rough and he's raw. And I completely identify to Peter. Untrained. But Peter had the heart of a lion. He was, he was courageous, and he wasn't afraid to back down from being a leader. Listen to what, uh, let's listen to what, uh, John, what? John chapter 20, 21, I mean, I apologize, 21. And we're going to read with, we're going to read beginning with verse 20. Peter turned now this is at the end, uh, just before the ascension. Peter turned and saw following them the disciple whom Jesus loved, and that's obviously uh, the Apostle John, who had laid his head on his breast at the, at the Last Supper and had said, Lord, who is it that is going to betray you? This is all stuff that previewed before the Last Supper. And when Peter saw him, he said to Jesus, Lord, what about this man? In other words, Jesus has just questioned Peter three times and said, Do you love me? Do you love me? Do you love me? Then feed my sheep, feed my sheep, feed my sheep. And Peter's all distracted by the moment. Well, what about John? What about John? And Jesus gives him a very specific message here. And it's one that we need to be aware of this morning. <laughs> Peter saw him and he said to Jesus, Lord, what about this man? And Jesus said to him, If it is my will that he remain until I come, what is that to you? Follow me. When we stand before God, we're not going to be judged for the actions of anybody else. Aren't you grateful for that? I am too. Tracy gets me in trouble all the time. <laughs> We all know that's a lie, huh? <laughs> We're not going to be judged for the actions of anybody else. We're going to be judged for our own heart for God. And so God's message is to you, what do you care about that man? What is it your job to worry about that person? You, follow me. The call of God is a specific response of the heart of every believer to get in the boat and to follow God and to set out to the deeps. You follow me. Let's go back a little bit. Luke chapter 5. We're going to go back to our main text. <laughs> yeah, that's bad for the count. <laughs> Put out to the deep and let down your nets. Getting to the deep is work. Imagine rowing against the tide as the waves splash against the shore, tired from already working all day. It takes work to get to the deep things of God. How many times I wanted to go to sleep at night? I don't even know how many times I've told Tracy, I'll be right in. Two or three hours go by, 
And I'm still up seeking God, still up. You know why? I'm going to tell you a secret why. I'm not telling you that other than to say this. If you rely solely upon the level of energy that your body is able to muster, you will never get into the depths of God. Sometimes you have to come to God tired and fatigued. And I will tell you a truth that I have found a, a thousand times, uh, out of a thousand times to be true. That those times when I purpose in my heart to go get along with God, no matter how I'm feeling in my mind or in my body, <laughs> as I begin to open my Bible and I put on the Christian music and I just begin to focus everything else take focus off of everything else except Christ, I am suddenly energized with this divine glory that fills up my body, and I can't even sleep if I wanted to, because I'm too excited to be in the fellowship of the Master. Hallelujah. I know why Jesus prayed all night. Because it was a time when everybody else was sleeping, they stopped tugging in his shirt sleeves. And he could stay up all night. And the Bible says, They that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings as eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. Amen. You cannot rely on the signals of your flesh to live in the presence of God or to experience the depths of His calling. There has to be something in you that compels you, that invites you, that wants to respond to the holy invitation of God Almighty to come into the Holy of Holies and to live in His presence and to seek hard after the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. What's the result of a life like that? Peter's frustrated and he says, Lord, we've worked all day and we've caught nothing. There's just no fruit to our labors, Lord. Nevertheless, Lord, it's your command, I will obey. We walk by faith and not by feelings. That's right. Amen. We don't walk by sight. We walk by the holy command of God Almighty. And when you respond to that, and you listen to that invitation, and you take those first steps of obedience to do what God has called you to do in spite of how you feel, the net result is there's a catch so great that the boat can't hold it. You've got to call people to come and help reel in the fish. There needs help. And wouldn't it be like that if we had such a revival in this mm -hmm. town that all the churches were involved in it because mm -hmm. there were so many people getting saved that this Hallelujah. church, Calvary Chapel, Victory Life, vineyard, all three of them, they couldn't hold the Hall of Fish. We need the BFW Hall. We need the Convention Center. We might have to rent Mile High Stadium. We need help. Come and help us reel the fish in. Amen. Good word, bro. They beckoned to their partners. Now, these weren't men in the same boat that they were in. And I long for the day when we get past our denominationalism. They beckoned to their partners in the other boats to come and help them. And they came in and filled both the boats so that they began to sink. But when Simon Peter saw it, he fell down at Jesus' knees, saying, Depart from me, for I am a sinful man, O Lord. For he was astonished at all that were with him and at the catch of fish which they had taken. And I'm telling you what, as we move toward the landscape of this transition into this new church, I'm looking for a catch of fish. I'm looking for a new catch of fish. Sunday school teachers, associate pastors, musicians. There's going to be so many fish coming in, we're going to have to call for help. Amen. The thing that stands out to me in Peter's response, oh Lord, I'm a sinful man. As Jesus, Peter fell at Jesus' feet, confessing his unworthiness. And how many of us know that none of us are worthy? None of us are worthy of this call. And I'm going to tell you something. You may come into the kingdom feeling unworthy, but when you start living for the call of God and for the purpose of God, we are unworthy in and of ourselves. The old saying goes, and I know many of you have heard it, God doesn't call the equipped, He equips the called. 
the thing that's missing in the church today, the thing that's missing in the revival that we're looking for, is that people will just respond to the call of God. <coughs> Go to 1 Corinthians chapter 1. I know many of you know these passages of Scripture, but I want to give them to you in context of the message that God is giving us this morning. Listen to what Peter, look at listen to what the Apostle Paul, who felt unworthy, was like the least of all the apostles, came into the kingdom long after the after Pentecost, and, and big things were happening in Jerusalem and throughout Judea and Samaria. Listen to what Paul tells the Corinthians. For consider your call. And I'm asking you this morning, consider your call, brothers. Not many of you were wise according to the worldly standard. Not many of you were powerful. Not many of you were of noble birth. But God chose what is foolish in the world to shame the wise. God chose what is weak in the world to shame the strong. God chose what is low and despised in the world, even things that are not, to bring to nothing the things that are, so that no human being might boast in the presence of God. God purposely goes out seeking the things that have been rejected, the things that have been despised, the things that have been passed over, the things that have been written off by the world. And he says, that one, that one there will do for my purpose. That one... That one, I'm going to fill that one with my Holy Spirit. I'm going to anoint that one with a, with a call from heaven. I'm going to do big things in that. And those who wrote that one off, and those who said you will never be nothing, they will be amazed. And they will be hard-pressed to consider if that life has been transformed by anything other than the power of Almighty God. He is the source of your life in Christ Jesus, whom God made our wisdom and our righteousness and our sanctification and our redemption. Therefore, as it is written, let him who boasts, boast in the Lord. And I'm going to tell you something this morning. I'm not here today giving you this message because I had any particular intelligence. I certainly had no money. I had nothing to bring to the table but a, but a broken and empty heart, despised and rejected by the world, defeated Decades on, on top of decades upon decades. But God. But God in His infinite wisdom. But God looked upon this rejected, miscreant, vagabond, broken hearted, wandering soul that had nothing to offer the world. Nothing. I had nothing to offer. Nothing. And God chose me out of the nothingness that I was and filled me with the something that He is. But today, my heart beats every single beat with a breath that I excel to glorify the King of kings and Lord of lords because I know that without Him, I am nothing. In Him, I can do nothing. That my life was worthless. It wasn't worth a piece of scratch paper that would take to write my name on a depository slip of the morgue. But Jesus had a plan. In 1 Corinthians 15, The Bible says that God is no respecter of persons. That's right. That what He has done for one, He will do for all. And if God's not moving on our behalf, it's not God's fault. I'm going to tell you right now, the Spirit of God hovers over the face of the darkness of the depths, and He's just waiting for somebody that will speak the Word. Somebody that will open their mouth and declare the Word of God and the promises of God so that He can create light. Will you open your mouth and speak the word and be a vessel of His holy promise? Because that Holy Spirit's hovering over the top of your life right now just waiting. Waiting for you to unction, uh, exhale a breath and unction from the Spirit of the living God. Verse 8 from 1 Corinthians. Last of all, 
as one untimely born, he appeared unto me, for I am the least of all the apostles, until, until to be called an apostle, because I persecuted the church of God, but by the grace of God I am what I am, and his grace toward me was not in vain. On the contrary, I worked harder than all of them, though I was not, though it was not I, but the grace of God which is with me, whether then it was I or they, so we preach and so you believe. Will you believe in the grace of God this morning? Go to Matthew chapter 8, verse 18. God doesn't care where you've been. He doesn't care. He doesn't care about your failures. When you confess those sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. God doesn't care about the deeds of yesterday. He's more concerned about this moment and what your future looks like. Matthew 8, 18. Now when Jesus saw the great crowds around him, he gave orders to go over to the other side. And God is giving you orders this morning to go over to the other side. To go over to the other side of the life that you've lived. To go over to the other side of the attitude that you've had. To go over to the other side of the lake where the promises of God will, will be found. He gave orders to go over to the other side. And a scribe came up and said to him, Teacher, I will follow you wherever you go. And Jesus had to very merely utter the words, Foxes have holes and birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man has nowhere to go to lay his head. Another of the disciples said to him, Lord, let me first go bury my father. But Jesus said to him, Follow me and leave the dead to bury their own dead. In other words, the walking dead, those who don't know God. Now, what did we learn from these two passages of Scripture, or these two fellows in this passage of Scripture? That the kingdom of God is more than lip service. And I see it all the time. We've had a guy that has attended this church off and on periodically, and he'll get up and he'll put his arms just like this on me. Brother, I'm here for you. You can call on me anytime you want. And then he's gone for a month, five, six weeks. I wish I had a nickel for every time I've heard that. Lip service. And the kingdom of God is more than lip service. Isaiah said, this people honors me with their lips, but their, their hearts, hearts are far, are far, far from, from me. me. God doesn't care about your Facebook post. He doesn't care about the sticker on the back of your car. He wants to know what's in your heart. And are you willing to surrender your life to fulfill the call of God on your life? Because some of you in here, sitting here right here today, are destined for great things. You don't even know what God has for you. I didn't know what God had for me sitting in a jail cell. I hadn't a clue. I never dreamed I'd be a business owner. Never dreamed I'd be pastoring a church. I never dreamed we'd be growing and experiencing things. I never dreamed that we'd see the transformation of lives. I couldn't even get my own life changed, let alone be used to see other people's lives. I never dreamed that it would be this good in Christ. Ah. Hallelujah. But you know what? You get up every single day and you surrender that day and that hour to the purpose of Almighty God. And one day, one step, one foot, one breath, one promise, one minute at a time, God's reality and the king, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven will begin to manifest itself around you and in you and you will become what God has ordained you to become. Hallelujah. Amen. One day at a time. Being faithful in the trenches. Faithful to do the work. Faithful to open your heart. Faithful to open your Bible. No more excuses. Get into the boat. Follow Jesus. And start rowing for the other side. Jeremiah. One of my favorite Old Testament prophets. If not my very favorite I love Jeremiah. I can't wait. I look forward to seeing the Apostle Paul. I can't hardly wait 
to fall at the feet of Jesus. I cannot wait to fellowship with Moses or to see Abraham. But I'm going to have fellowship with Jeremiah because this was a man who suffered dearly. For 40 years he preached the gospel to a nation that refused to hear him. He suffered so dearly that even after the Babylonians had come and gone and told the people that were left in Jerusalem that they would be all right if they just maintained the land, their fear caused them to run to Egypt. They ran back to the place that God had delivered them from. Well, guess what? Egypt was left on the bucket on Nebuchadnezzar. Nebuchadnezzar's bucket list, it still needed to be conquered. So when Nebuchadnezzar started to march toward Egypt, they were killed. In Egypt, when they were told that they stayed in Jerusalem, they would survive the captivity. God's telling you this morning, stop running back to your Egypts. And they kidnapped this mighty man of God who delivered the promise. And when things didn't go well for him in Egypt, they stoned him. They carried him off against his will to Egypt and killed him. That is a man who suffered for the gospel, the message of the cross. Listen to God's words to him. Now the word of the Lord came to me saying, Before I formed you in the womb. What chapter or verse? Chapter 1, verse 4. Sorry. I'll give you all a second to catch up. And a couple of you some mustard. Are you there? Yeah. Amen. Isaiah, are you there? Amen. That little boy's a preacher. <coughs> make it. Now the word of the Lord came to me saying, Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Let me know the word of God is for you too. Amen. 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 So it doesn't matter where you're at in the birth order. Before the, before the foundations of the world, God formed you in your mother's womb, and He knew who you would become. It doesn't matter. None of that matters to God. What matters to God is your heart this morning. And I'm telling you, as the pastor of this church, we're going to go someplace. And I want you all that are here to be a part of it. I truly do. As we cross the bridge and cross over the Colorado River, I, I picture in my heart God taking many of us into the promised land of His, His purpose and destiny for us. Yeah. I want you to be there. And I'm telling you, you won't be if you don't answer the call of God. You won't be. Before I knew you, before you were born, I consecrated you. I appointed you a prophet to the nations. And I want you just to put in the place of prophet a messenger. Then I said, Oh, Lord, God, behold, I do not know how to speak for you. I'm only a youth. And may, some of you may be young in your faith. You might even be young in your, in your life. But the Lord said to me, Do not say I am only a youth. For to all to whom I send you, you shall go. And whatever I command you, you shall speak. Be not afraid of them, for I am with you to deliver you, says the Lord. It doesn't matter your limitation. It doesn't matter if you're young or old. It doesn't matter if, you've been, if you feel adequate or inadequate. It doesn't matter. What matters is if the holy God who's calling you, and will you open your mouth in response to the call? Then the Lord put forth his hand and touched my mouth. And the Lord said to me, Behold, I have put my words in your mouth. See, I have set you this day over nations and over kingdoms to pluck up and to break down, to destroy, to overthrow, and to build and to plant. And there's some things in America that need to come down. Amen? Amen. Some strongholds that Amen. need to be tore down. Some philosophies and some new age thinking. Some immoral dress. Some immoral parenting need to be torn down, and we need to plant and build up and restore and rebuild the walls of truth, nobility, and character around our country and around our nation and around our city and around our homes. There must have been something in that transition from Jeremiah saying, I'm not worthy, I can't do this, I'm just a kid, 
And God said, no, 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 son. It's not about you. It's about me. It's about my word. And the light must have went on for Jeremiah. Oh, yeah. And the minute it did, in his understanding, God said, now I'm going to put my word in you. There was a willingness that took place in Jeremiah's heart. And when it did, God equipped Jeremiah. He put the word of the living God in his mouth. And here I am, thousands of years later, quoting from the writings of this young man who thought he was inadequate to preach the word of God. Don't tell me what God cannot do if you will let him. Don't tell me the limitations you face. The greatest limitation we face as God's people is our lack of faith in the God that we claim we serve and love. Amen. Amen. Matthew 28. Perhaps the reason we live in failure is because we have our eyes on ourselves. And I had to repent this week because last Sunday I stood up here and I, I confessed to you and I went home grieved in my heart Sunday after the service and I'm like, God, I did not betray a heart of faith to your people this morning. I let them see me on my heels. I let them see me uh, concerned about the future. I repented because I was looking at me and what I felt we could do. And I repented in the face of God and in the face of that uh, communication to you all last Sunday. And I began to pray at the beginning of this week. God, this isn't about me. It's about you. And I'm going to trust the very God who said, let there be light. Hallelujah. And God gave me a divine unction. You know how I found this church this week? I've been up there to look at it twice. Once with a realtor, another, another time just to drive by. Uh, we attended church in this building on numerous occasions. Once for a retirement uh, service. Uh, and I'll wrap it up here pretty quick. Once for a retirement service. And then uh, when we were at the gathering, we went down there. Pastor Crowley was teaching there on a Sunday night. And then when we were uh, kind of in between churches, we went there, didn't we, Ash? What, three or four times we went to this church? I knew about the building. So when I went up there and saw the for sale sign with the realtor and went in and looked around, I prayed to God, is this your will? Nothing, you know, the, the, the price that they were asking was so out there, it was beyond the realm of, of our reach. There's something in me this, this week. We got done Wednesday morning. I had some stuff to do. I was helping a couple of the guys at the house and helping Robert. We dropped off the furniture that we needed. And I suddenly found myself with an empty truck. Ashley was holding down the fort at the thrift store, which I appreciated. Because she was there, I was able to have a few minutes to go do what a pastor needs to do. And on an unction from the Holy Spirit, I just thought, well, I'm going to drive up there. I'm going to go up there and spy out the land one more time. I'm going to go up there and pray. Because of all the places in Grand Junction, it just seemed to be the only place that I continued to be drawn to. And I went up there, and I was sitting on one side of the building, and I felt like God spoke to me and said, drive around the building. So I did. <laughs> I put the truck in reverse, and I drove around the building. And I went around the back side, and there was a minivan parked in the very back corner by the very back door. And I'm like, ooh, there's life. <laughs> <laughs> Jumped out of the truck, and just as I jumped out of the truck, the pastor, Pastor Farmer, came out the back door. I'm like, Pastor Farmer, like, Gene, how are you doing? Good? How are you doing? Well, I'm good. I said, What's going on with the church? And we began to have a discussion. And he began to tell me what was going on with the church and who I could contact. I contacted this old guy, 83 years old, been preaching since 1955. That's about the time Billy Graham got started. Holy man of God. You still see the twinkle in his eye and the fire in his belly. He barely walk, But he got a twinkle for Jesus. I called him on the phone. I told him what we were going through. He said, meet me tomorrow at 30. Sat there for two hours, interviewed with him and his wife. The church is yours. We'll make plans. They called the association in Missouri. They're like, good, there's going to be a pastor there. Yay, has he got a good Bible pastor? Yes, he is. Well, why don't you just invite him into the association? We won't charge him any rent at all. I'm telling you what, we serve a big God. He's a big God. He's a big God. Big God. 
It only takes a seed of the size of a mustard seed to move a mountain. We gotta get our eyes off ourselves, guys. I'm not preaching to my own heart this morning. Let's hear what Jesus tells his disciples. While wow, that verse 11, 20 to 11. Uh, no, we're going to skip down to verse 16 for time. Now the eleven disciples went to Galilee to the mountain to which Jesus had directed them. And when they saw him, they worshipped him. Oh, but some doubted. And Jesus came and said to them, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go! Therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always to the close of the ends of the age. All authority has been given to Christ, and he's telling us, go. He doesn't tell us to sit. He doesn't tell us to sit and feel sorry for ourselves. He doesn't tell us to sit and doubt. He says, you go in my name, and I will equip you with what you need. Hallelujah. You go. Just Hallelujah. go. Hallelujah. And when you do, I'm with you. And I, will, and I will accompany you until the very last day of the last breath, of the last minute of my divine purpose in the last age. I am with you. And nothing will stand in your way. Our God is great. Amen. 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 Last verse, Acts chapter 1. We got to get out of ourselves. We got to get out of ourselves. We got to get out of here if it's the last thing we do. I have been teaching for weeks and weeks about entering into the presence of God and living for the holy purpose of God. And I'm saying to you today, will you respond to the call of God? Will you? I'm going to pick up verse 4, chapter 1. And while staying with him, he charged them not to depart from Jerusalem, but to wait for the promise. You have to wait for the promise. It's not going to happen overnight. The promise of the Father, which he said, which you heard from me, for John baptized you with water, but before many days you shall be baptized with the Holy Spirit. So when they had come together, they asked him, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? And he said to them, it is not for you to know the times or seasons. And I'm going to tell you this morning, many of you will look at the news, watching stuff on YouTube, thinking about the end of the ages. And God doesn't want you to be focused about the seasons or the time. He wants you to be out doing his work, inviting people into the kingdom and living for the purpose of the call of God. It is not for you to know the times or seasons which the Father has fixed by His own authority. But you shall be, but you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in Judea and Samaria and then unto the ends of the earth. You have a call to be somebody, to take a, the best message that's ever been heralded on the fa- on the face of the planet, and to go into all the world, starting right here in Grand Junction. Some of you will be sent out from this church to Uganda or Peru or in Yugoslavia or Ecuador because we're going to have a missions team that starts right here, right here in our own little city, right here in our own little homes, right here in our own little town, right here on our own little neighborhood, right here on our own little street corner. Because the Bible says when you're faithful with little, more will be given to you we have to be faithful with the net with, with this neighborhood, and we have been, and that's why God's moving us on. Amen. We've been faithful to declare the word of God on this street corner. Amen. We've been faithful to do what God's called us to do, and He's calling us on now to Samaria, and eventually in the innermost parts of the earth. Go, I'm saying to you this morning, go in His name. Amen. 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 Amen.